the McIlvaney Weekly Commentary, covering monetary, economic, and geopolitical news events. MMT is about using word games to make people believe that the U.S. can have Northern European levels of government spending without Northern European levels of taxation. It's a great PR campaign because the far edge of the Democratic Party, particularly kind of the socialist leaning, very progressive left, is saying we can have everything and pay for it with freshly printed cash. You don't have to worry about taxes. Now here are Kevin Oreck and David McIlvaney. Welcome to the McIlvaney Weekly Commentary. I'm Kevin Oreck along with David McIlvaney. Well, as promised, Dave, you've done an awful lot of research on an old idea that a lot of people think is new, uh, modern monetary theory. Just a, a new name for an old, failed idea. Yeah, and it's no surprise that you know we're hearing this popularized and coming from the legislative halls of Washington, D.C. And it's a juicy offer because it provides something of a free lunch. Well, you know what it reminds me of? In a way, you go back 500 years, Ponce de Leon was looking for this elusive thing called the Fountain of Youth. And the thought was, if he could find it, and I think he was looking in Florida and in that region, the idea, if you could find it, you could have close to eternal life. There's still a lot of people in Florida looking for the Fountain of Youth. <laughs> well, that's true. It doesn't seem to be working. <laughs> no, no. But it, what, what's unique about this is that the modern monetary theory crowd you know, go back 10, 15 years ago, and there was the idea that maybe we could have, you know, a basic minimum income, or maybe we should focus on guaranteed jobs. And that's been a refined, if you look at the way their community has directed the conversation, now it's really focused on guaranteed jobs. And again, this is sort of a world where justice and equality are extended to all. It sounds pretty good to be true, particularly when you think about the price tag. Dave, I mean, if this stuff worked, I would sign up. Guaranteed jobs and free money and continued growth. Why wouldn't any of us sign up except for the knowledge of the past? And this is where reflecting on the past, there's nothing new here. Right, um, right. This concept has been rebranded as modern monetary theory, and it is currently taking the nation by storm. But, you know, where does the influence come from? This is sort of the latest, greatest, bright idea. And we can actually trace its record through at least three centuries. And if we wanted to take a couple hours instead of the limited time we have today, we could actually track it back three millennia in terms of the same proposition right. and the same funding mechanism for the proposition. Minor variations, minor variations, but virtually the same thing going back three millennia. Dave, most people think of their money a little like they think of air. They never think of it. Okay. When I'm breathing, I'm continually needing air. I just take it for granted that it's there. Money is the same thing. Most people just try to figure out, hey, do I have enough to pay the bills this month? They're not trying to philosophically figure out what the heck money is until it's threatened. I'm training for an open water swim here pretty soon. And one of the recommended tips for doing open water swims where there's a lot of chop in the water and, and some waves and things like that is get used to not breathing. <laughs> and, and so, I mean, what that means is, you know, when you're in the yeah. pool training for it, maybe you ordinarily breathe every three strokes. We'll extend that to five and then extend that to seven. And learn not to panic without it. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. So, but your body does panic without it. And you're right. We do take for granted something like air until your body's in that. So you can't get it. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. Well, I, th I think most people, when they reflect on money, it's a practical reflection. It's right. not a particularly philosophical one. And, you know, it's things like how much of it do I have? Um, what can it be exchanged for? What quantity of money represents a significant amount of wealth? And then maybe in, this verges on the philosophical. How does a steward of such wealth protect it? How do you put it to good use? Look at the person in Venezuela. Okay, they probably took their money for granted, just like they did air, until all of a sudden their money didn't buy anything. Of course, being a student of philosophy, maybe I, I tend towards the philosophical question, but there is a more philosophical question, one that affects all of us every day. The question is, what is what is money? Right. You know, we did a we did a video, and you can find it on YouTube called "What Is Real Money?" Maybe three years ago, four years ago. But there are several questions, and the simplest is this: I mean, what do you buy things with? Right. You know, when you're thinking about what is money, what do you buy things with? So, to be more specific, 
It's a quantity of some physical asset. It's divisible. It's useful in the exchange for goods or services. And, you know, the reality is through time, many things have been experimented with. Many assets have been tried in that regard. And over thousands of years, you've got this trial and error. And through that trial and error, gold and silver proved to be by far the best options. Yeah, so- you know, it's interesting going back and looking back just at the last century. I mean, bars of soap have been used as money. Uh, cigarettes in prison have been used as money. Vodka. Klaus Buescher told me when he was in Germany during the war, vodka after the war, when the Deutschmark collapsed, was used. And the problem is central banks don't store a third of their reserves in cigarettes or vodka, vodka, but right. gold, they do. Right. So you've, you've got the added value of a concentrated form of wealth, something that doesn't erode or go away. So there's lots of reasons why gold and silver kind of became the best options, but you boil it down to relative scarcity. Mm-hmm. and the endurability of precious metals. And that kind of elevates them above the options. So, you know, again, back through the uh, list of, of things, shells, feathers, agricultural commodities, which obviously don't store very well, but even things that do last a little bit longer, bronze, copper. And then, of course, you know, we've got paper and certificates, which have a long history as well, but not as the most reliable means of exchange and store value. Well, we've seen gold used as money. We've seen gold and silver here in America used as money. That was called a bimetallism. There was some debate between two camps focusing either on exclusively gold backing or gold and silver backing. And the populace of the time, the populace of the time liked the idea of an easy money policy. And they got more easy money by having something that was easier to access, which was silver. Right. So, you know, the bimetallist argument played out in Frank Baum's story, The Wizard of Oz. Yeah, you know, it's interesting. Dorothy in The Wizard of Oz in the book was originally wearing silver slippers walking on the golden road. Well, so, I mean, again, these ideas have a long history, the gold backing, uh, the gold and silver backing, and some would argue that value to that kind of a monetary system is intrinsic to precious metals. Mm -hmm. Others maintain that the value is related to the quantity of labor needed to produce it. That's sort of the Bitcoin argument, isn't it? The quantity of labor, that's the main thing that they lean on. That's right. So I think cultural consensus over the millennia is is that metals are indeed precious. And so the gold monetary system has stood the test of time around the world. It's endured beyond any experiment of a purely paper variety. And, you know, accordingly, we have the abandonment of our metallic standard, and we've seen a significant cost to that. One of the things that we mentioned last week is this idea that it once was a 20 to 1 exchange ratio between the dollar and an ounce of gold. Then with a devaluation in 1933, it went to 35 to 1. And now if you do the math, it's north of 6,000 to 1 uh, in terms of the exchange rate of one ounce of gold to an inflation-adjusted, be clear on this, an inflation-adjusted number of dollars because of the devaluation we've seen in the price of gold. What that argues also is that gold at 1200 1300 is undervalued relative to its inflation-adjusted price. It also shows me, you know, you mentioned the abandonment of the metallic standard. Well, that was just an official abandonment. And what's changed in, through time is now that we have a larger quantity of dollars in circulation, the limit was 20 to 1, the limit was 35 to 1. Now, in terms of the quantity of dollars in circulation, we have over 6,000 to 1. There's no limit as to what we can print or create. So this is the story of a gradual devaluation, right? America has done this moving away from the metallic standard in stages from 1922 with the new gold exchange standard, 1933 with the out and out devaluation under FDR, and then finally in 1971 with the end of the Bretton Woods Agreement. You know, you had talked about the abandonment of the metallic standard, but that was just the official abandonment. In other words, the government abandoned the metallic standard, but gold continued to hold its value. I think that's a key here. Uh, A couple of weeks ago, we talked about how you paid for a haircut in gold. What would have been 50 cents worth of gold 100 years ago now was $33 worth of gold, but it was the same weight in gold. And, you know, I think part of that official abandonment 
comes from blaming gold for the Great Depression. You know, Ben Bernanke, that was one of his main thesis. We're just going to go ahead and blame gold for the Great Depression. And that is commonly accepted in the economic community to this day. Well, and the idea there is that you have a restraint on liquidity. And what you need in a time of crisis is greater liquidity, but you can't do anything to solve that problem, a liquidity constraint, because gold is naturally constricted. So so that's the argument is, look, we wouldn't be in this problem if we'd had more money to throw at the issue. What that doesn't address is what happens if you have all the money in the world to throw at a problem. That may solve a liquidity crisis, but it doesn't necessarily solve any other crisis. In fact, it may, it may cause a series of crises thereafter. But don't we have a long history of experiments of trying to remove those restraints? Well, and I think this is where it's, you know, we talked a little bit about metallism and bimetallism, where, where precious metals are sort of valued as a core to the currency. Paper currency alternatives also have a long history. You look at paper money experiments, and they date back to ancient China. Mm. And if you're looking at, you know, sort of non-gold credit claims, this goes back to Mesopotamia, where it could be argued that these money-like qualities associated with clay tablets, which show who owes what to whom, again, they date back even further to ancient Mesopotamia. You know, speaking of that, even in Greece, a few hundred years before Christ, there was a law given for anyone who would try to take the money off of the silver standard would be killed. Okay, it was a death penalty to remove the money from the silver standard. Well, guess where that came from? They had removed restraint before. They went through a hyperinflation and a collapse, and they realized you can't do that. Well, and that's what most academics don't appreciate, is that there are social and political ramifications, which can be the undoing of a nation when you begin to toy with the value of the currency. Yes, in the short run, you can throttle the advantages of liquidity. But in the long run, there are things like, again, you mentioned the case in Greece. They took it so seriously, having an established value for a currency. And the only reason they did that, the only reason they codified it. It came with pain. Well, exactly. You see that from a generation to generation basis. There is a generation which cares about a certain set of values, but they only are committed at a deep level based on their personal experience of tragedy and pain. Mm. Notice that the central bank in Germany has had a deep commitment to stable value. And they're kind of the curmudgeons in Europe. It's because they destroyed their currency twice in the 20th century, completely. That's right. So they have this deep, visceral, um, <laughs> almost pain memory, which like, we can't go back to that. We don't want to do that. That's a bad idea. But again, so the value of money, let's go back to the paper issue and sort of the experimentation with paper currency alternatives, because you define the value in money differently. It's not intrinsic. It's not socially agreed upon. And it's not according to the labor that goes into its creation. If you're trying to sell the paper side of things, the no restraint That's side right. of things. So the value of money in this view, and this plays into MMT, is that value is assigned by government. And it sustains its value because of the government's power to tax, mm. right? So you say, well, we're never going to go broke because we can always increase taxes, right? So with the power to print and not being restricted by a scarce commodity resource to back the currency, nations that have tried these experiments have all watched them fail as the increase in quantities of money ultimately compromised quality. So again, the increase in quantity ultimately compromises quality and leads to the currency extinction events we associate with inflation. So this paper money system referred to as fiat money is also known as chartalism. Okay, so this is where, again, we say MMT is not new. We've known chartalism and its various iterations through the centuries and even through the millennia. Okay, but here's a pop quiz for you. Name one single occasion, since it's been tried so many times, name one occasion where it was a success. Well, because it hasn't worked in the past doesn't mean it won't work this time. And I, that's the idea is this time is different. Right. This time is different. Maybe it didn't <laughs> work in the past, but a new name has been given to the old school of chartalism, and that is modern monetary theory, or MMT for short. That's what we mentioned earlier. And it focuses on the state's role in creating money. Hmm. It promotes the idea that because the state has the power to tax, because the state has the power to print, because the state issues debt in the same currency that it prints, we should not be afraid. We shouldn't be afraid of high levels of debt. We shouldn't be afraid of deficit spending. In fact, 
these conditions, they would argue, they would argue, under those conditions, it's impossible for a government to become insolvent. That's a huge claim, but that is one that goes in lockstep with the MMT theory, is if you can print in your own currency and you can issue debt in your own currency, it is impossible for a government to become insolvent. If you look at the proponents of the MMT, they're also talking about other things that don't seem likely to actually be able to happen. I'm thinking the Green New Deal. Yeah, well, I mean, if we all had our wishes, right? Right. And if wishes were horses, guess what? Beggars would ride. I right. mean, this is this right. is the reality. Today's proponents of MMT, they mix economists and social justice warriors, uh, you know, in terms of kind of who is involved in it, and they define a range of spending initiatives. You say the Green New Deal. Yeah, yeah eighty eight trillion, I think I read, was what the Green New Deal actually would cost. <laughs> well, and then you've got Elizabeth Warren's idea of sort of health coverage for all, a mere ninety three trillion to cover that. Mm. Universal basic income, making sure that Everybody has something coming in every month and maybe gets to pursue the good life with greater free time. I mean, it's like Thorstein Veblen's theories of the leisure class, except it's not for those who have money as in an excess of money. It's for those who have enough to go spend and experience leisure. But you can see where this sells to the person who thinks, well, maybe you can. Maybe you can print all the money you need. Well, the idea is, and they've moved away from arguing on UBI, universal basic income, have put more emphasis on job guarantee programs that eliminate all unemployment. And that's, mm. that's one of their key focuses now. And they're basically saying, look at the wealth or poverty of a nation. Why would you have anyone unemployed? These are resources which should be utilized and it's time to pay someone something for doing something. Well, it's excellent PR, though, for the people who seem to be discredited right now. Well, and I mean, discredited or not, I think MMT solves the PR and marketing problem for progressives, right. which is really how do we pay for this stuff? Because the MMT crowd, they are providing a creative approach for taking care of the old issue. Back to this idea of a free lunch. Yeah. Come on. We all know that there's no such thing as a free lunch. So who actually pays for the free lunch, right? With their plan, there's no need to raise taxes. There's no concern about increasing debt. And those are the issues which become politically contentious. From the fiscal side, you've got the fiscal hawks who don't want to see an increase in debt. From the constituents of the upper middle class, the middle class, these are folks who would say, raise taxes. Are you kidding me? We do all of the working and bleeding and dying in this country, and you want us to give even more? So again, we're talking about political contention, which goes away if you just say, hey, listen, we can borrow all we want. We can spend all we want. As long as we can print all we want. That's right. Because if you're borrowing in your currency, you can also determine the supply of currency units to pay back that debt. If you control the printing press, so the argument goes, you can pay for anything, including a mountain of existing debt. No reason to worry about the $22 trillion in debt. What, what a passe idea. Why have you been concerned in the least about that debt? All you have to do is hit command P the print function, and you've got all you need. Couldn't we also call that legal counterfeiting? Okay, let's pretend like you and I are playing a game of Monopoly, and I'm a player that has a certain amount of money. You're a player that has a certain amount of money. That's how the whole game works, except I can continue to print money. Every time I want to buy a property, I just print more and more money. Now, not only is that a game that will fail, the currency will fail, because at some point, I lose credibility. Well, and I think that's really the issue, isn't it? Ignored in the proposal by the chartalist crowd, the MMT crowd, is the issue of maintaining, maintaining credibility. Because yeah, for the currency. At the front end, yeah. let's just give them, for the sake of argument, the benefit of the doubt. You're assigning an official price. Okay, great. You just assign an official price. By mandate, the government says these units, currency units, are worth X, Y, and Z. Assigning an official price is different than maintaining a stable value through time. You have to assume a high degree of control in the system for price setting to work. A public policy blogger, Matt Brunig, actually quite socialist in his, in his leanings, if you, if you get a chance to read any of his things. But th this was interesting. He says this, that MMT is about using word games to make people believe that the U.S. can have northern European levels of government spending without northern European levels of taxation. We mm. go back to this idea of it's a great PR campaign because the, the far edge of 
the Democratic Party, particularly kind of the socialist leaning, very progressive left is saying we can have everything and pay for it with freshly printed cash. You don't have to worry about taxes. Let me throw this out to you, though. Okay, so let's say that we're in a command and control environment. Let's say that we're in a sphere that's sealed. In other words, no one else has to give credibility to our money. We're just in, we're basically told the value. We're in a system that has to use that value. I'll tell you where I'm going with this. There was an experiment with something called the biosphere down in Arizona. It was like an enclosed greenhouse, but it was to produce its own oxygen from inside. Now, it didn't work. I mean, one of the past residents of the biosphere looked at the people inside and realized they were just slowly suffocating. So they they broke the window to get some oxygen in. Okay, it's very hard to actually have an enclosed system. But we know that the dollar can't have its own value in an enclosed system because we need international trade. I mean, how do you keep international credibility during a period of time of modern monetary theory? So, I mean, you do have this advantage in a command and control environment. You can use declarative statements to establish worth. In a sealed system. Right. But you also have to have the power of coercion in order to maintain a set established price. Right. And and so, you know, you have to, to have an enforcement mechanism, and usually that is a high penalty. And right? a captive audience. That's right. So, Otherwise, the market will vote and the market will weigh that price that has been mandated. It'll weigh it on a scale of risk and reward. And the price won't stay put, even if that is movement unofficial in what we would call the black market. Currencies Mm -hmm. have always been and will always be a game of confidence. And so in that game of confidence, you've got the willing participants and they represent a vote of confidence or those that can be sort of corralled and cowed into using it by force. Then you've got the unwilling participants that will opt out or can opt out. (laughs) I mean, can, maybe will is more appropriate, but that's a vote of no confidence Mm -hmm. when they opt out. And then you have values rise, obviously, as a reflection of confidence, and they fall as a reflection of the failing of confidence as owners of the asset or of the currency abandon that, and it's reflected in the price. I'm looking at Russia last year. Russia started voting against the dollar without really telling anybody. They started selling most of their treasuries. Russia has already voted against the dollar, maybe looking ahead at some changes that they see coming down the pike. But in hyperinflationary periods, that's exactly what's happening. People are voting against that particular currency. They're exiting the currency. Well, and you remember we were in Argentina in 2014. Right. And the official exchange rate was uh, something like you know, 12 to 1, except the street exchange rate was more like 18 to yeah, 1. Yeah, they wanted our dollars and they were not going to be traded at the official exchange rate. They wanted out of their own currency. Right. So they called it in Argentina the blue market. The rate. blue market. But right. the reality is what we're talking about is the black market emerging to tell you what the actual price is. The street rate, (laughs) it trumps. It trumps the official stated rate, the mandated rate. So you've got the Kirshner government who had established and mandated the price, and yet everybody knows it's unrealistic. So now we have a 46 to 1 exchange rate with the currency down in Argentina. It's continued to deteriorate over the last four or five years. And, you know, to your point, the history of super and hyperinflations, these are periods marked by a delegitimizing process where the official assigned value gets second guessed. And, and the currency of the country becomes something like a hot potato. No one wants to hold it for very long due to the short time frames between one level of devaluation and the next. So the currency efficacy, its uh, vitality, its effectiveness as a means of exchange is diluted and of course as a store of value, is diluted by the mass printing and a return to the market of previously held notes. What do I mean by that? Because you you not only have the printing function, but you also have the repudiation function, which is where people say, what I have I no longer want, and there's more supply that hits the market because no one wants to keep what they have. You know, if I were to say M equals T times P divided by Q to the square root of X, and we can print money as long as we can tax... Most people are going to go, well, he must know what he's talking about. I mean, if you can't convince them, confuse them. Right. So what you just told me is the math supports it. 
Really? Of course. Of well, course. And, and this is through time how confusing the issue is a bit of a problem. You have under the cover of accounting tautologies. Under the cover of accounting tautologies, the MMT crowd says that there is maximum benefit and there is minimal risk in blending your fiscal policy spending objectives, how we want to deliver benefits like jobs to everyone with the monetary policy machinery, which is just the ability to print money and credit. But you'll never get elected boring people. You know, as boring as it may seem, you have to define money in a way that it doesn't lose credibility, right? <laughs> That's right. And the way that you define money is critical to long-term economic and financial market stability. So yes, that's a boring topic. Nobody gets elected saying we we believe in sound money. Well, uh, you know what? That's actually it does sound pretty boring. But there's a few anecdotes which I think illustrate how important it is and I think they move our conversation, Kevin, from sort of the theoretical to the practical. Well, an almost perfect mirror would be somebody that you've talked about numerous times and just recently, John Law. Right. So let's put the theory of money and the difference between metallism, bimetallism, and chartalism, which has been recalled MMT or rebranded as MMT, let's put it in the context of sort of historical realism. So let's go into the TARDIS, the time machine, go back 300 years and look at whether this worked in the past. Yeah, I, I loved our conversation with Antoine Murphy where we're talking about Richard Cantillon and we're talking about the Mississippi bubble and what was happening in France at the time. John Law was a famous and he ultimately became an infamous. Actually, he started as an infamous guy. He, he was, he was an escaped convict <laughs> accused of murder, convicted of murder, escapes from prison, makes his way to France and all of a sudden kind of ingratiates himself uh, sure. to, to Louis the 14th. Well, he told Louis the 14th that he could have MMT. Well, that's right. He, he made a name for himself as an economist and monetary theoretician there in the 18th century. He argued in his book, Money and Trade, which is a pretty brilliant book, 1705 was written, that expansion of the money supply was necessary for economic development and that an increase in the quantity of money would not be inflationary because, because the increase in economic activity that it created would also increase demand for the newly printed money and eliminate the risk of inflation. Now, I say it's brilliant because no one had formalized this thinking. There had been experiments, monetary paper, monetary experiments in the past, but nobody had created sort of a theory around money and its growth as a means to drive growth. In is the this not exactly, though, what the now theory MMT is proponent of? Uh, this is consistent with MMT, where spending is the accelerator, taxation the breaks and you know so who's the audience louis the 14th you know he leaves france bankrupt you've got multiple wars you've got funding of a lavish lifestyle and law's ideas on banking and finance management they won him an audience with louis the 14th tell me more tell me more yeah, tell me what i want to hear yeah. <laughs> the big takeaway here is that law engineered a monetary policy coup in order to solve the fiscal concerns of the French state. And he was, because he answered the problem of the day, elevated to Minister of Finance. A, a Scotsman in France, elevated to the Minister of Finance, law went about liberating Louis from a massive quantity of debt. Okay, but it didn't look exactly like free money. You always have to have a twist that makes it look real. And I mean, he was talking about taking equity from the new frontier, the new country, the United States, uh, before it was the United States, and backing this free lunch with something that looked like equity. Yeah, debt to equity swap where demand in the exchange would create an artificial demand for the French currency. That was right. part of law scheme, converting the national debt into equity in the Mississippi Company. You've got French colonial development, which stretched across half the United States and was the exclusive asset of the Mississippi Company. So Mississippians, these were the, the early investors in the Mississippi Company scheme, they were being described by a newly coined phrase. Did you know that this is where the term millionaire came from? Really? The millionaires huh. were the early Mississippians who had gotten early in on the scheme. And as their fortunes grew, 
there was a lot of enthusiasm for this project. And so Law's process, what it required was the elimination of gold from the monetary system. Well, of course, system. you have to take discipline out. We talked about that earlier. And then there was the increase of French currency, called the livre at the time. There was an increase in the French currency in circulation. Now, ordinarily, this increase would have depreciated the currency. Yeah, except everybody wanted it at the time. They wanted in. Right. Uh, fear demand, of missing out. And it was demand for shares in the company, which created artificial demand for the currency because mm -hmm. you had to transact. You had to buy financial assets, French financial assets, to then exchange for shares in the Mississippi company. So actually, the currency strengthened for a time as foreign capital poured in to speculate in shares while the national debt was largely extinguished. Mm. You get Joseph Schumpeter, an economic historian who described law as in a class by himself. He worked out the economics of these projects with a brilliance and Schumpeter says, yes, profundity, which places him in the front ranks of monetary theorists of all time. And he's right. This was a brilliant scheme, but you've got a guy with street smarts like Richard Cantillon who says, this is a brilliant scheme, but it's destined to fail. I see the flaws within the brilliant scheme because not all the details add up, not all the numbers add up. And so Cantillon plays it for his own benefit and makes a fortune 10 times over, not only on the rise of shares, but also then on the decline in shares. And then basically for a third time in the currency exchange as people are trying to get out of the French currency, and he provides an illegal means for them to get out. Two of the great movies of my early childhood were with Paul Newman and Robert Redford. You know, you remember Butch Cassidy and the Sundance Kid, but, but The Sting, The Sting was about a confidence scheme. And what you see is they have to put this whole scheme together to convince people to bet on horses, and they think that it's a sure deal. It's a free money type of deal. And it's tested several times by the, the character that ultimately gets stung. He doesn't believe it. He tests it. And then he starts believing it. And that confidence builds to the point where he bets it all and then loses it all. Right. So, I mean, this to me, MMT, the fiat money theme, like all variations on the fiat money theme, confidence. Confidence, confidence is the key. Yeah. The confidence and belief of people that they're in on something, that it's on the ascendancy, that there is a benefit here that can't be explained away, that keeps them in the system and it keeps them playing the game. Yeah, they must have some in that nobody else has had in the past. Now, the flip side is also true. As confidence erodes, the system breaks down rapidly and the quantity of money in circulation all of a sudden matters again. And, and this is, you know, it doesn't matter how much is floating out there. It doesn't matter. But now when it's moving in reverse, it does. And you, you find self-interested individuals. They exit the system if they're permitted to. You know, so you go back to the case in France. In the 1720s in France, getting out of laws, chartalist monetary scheme was not so easy. You had foreign currency exchange, which was curtailed. You had gold and silver forbidden with the penalty of complete estate confiscation levied on those caught with any real quantity of gold or silver in their possession. A coin here or there wasn't going to matter. But if you were found to be hoarding precious metals, then again, complete estate confiscation. We're going to take it all. Fascinating. You go from the 1720s, 70 years later, just 70 years after Law's experiment in France, yeah, monetary and fiscal mismanagement triggers the total collapse of the French currency again. Yeah, in less again. than a century. The guillotine, the guillotine symbolized the populist demand for justice and equality in that latter episode. Now we're talking about, again, Robespierre. We're talking about the French Revolution. And in that episode, anyone trying to get out of the failing currency face the death penalty. Mm. So at first it was a state confiscation in the 1720s. By the 1790s, it's the death penalty. Twice, twice in the 18th century, the French currency was destroyed using a chartalist system. You had brought up how Germany and Europe had been influenced by the hyperinflations of Germany in the 20th century. And I remember talking to a man who whose family had lived through both. They had mortgaged their house three times to own it. They had lost the currency. They had lost the house over and over right after World War One, the early 20s. And then right after World War Two, this is the man who said that they actually used vodka as a trade unit for a while. But twice in the 20th century, we've seen the same thing in Germany. 
And let's look at some of the other countries. I mean, Zimbabwe, Venezuela, we could go on and on. Yeah, within the last two centuries, the 20th and the 21st century, you've had a similar blurring of lines between monetary policy tools, the ability to print or create credit and money, Mm -hmm. and the fiscal policy agendas. And it's created dangerous economic and political effects, which then ultimately have been accompanied by currency market debacles. Right, So you've got collapse of one sort or another, which has accompanied the chartalist approach to money in every scenario. So this last year is my family's watching the Super Bowl and the Rams are in the game. Who else was in the game? Oh, yeah. The Patriots were in the game again. Again. Everybody just plays the Patriots. That's how it works. And, and I said, I said, if anyone can tell me as you're watching this game, I want to know if you've been listening to me at the dinner table about what happens to money and monetary destruction during periods of inflation. But if you can tell me which of the players on the field has the same last name as the central banker in Europe who destroyed the monetary system, I'll give you a thousand dollars. And I, I, everybody was like, and I said, you only have one guess. So figure it out and then tell me because they would have gone. Is it, is it, is it, is it, is it? This sounds so much like a McIlvaney conversation during a Super Bowl. Nobody, nobody in the rest of the nation had that conversation, Dave. And so nobody guessed. I knew I was pretty safe. (laughs) Is there really a Havenstein on? There's there's a Havenstein. Havenstein on the Los Angeles Rams. On the Rams, really? Yeah, he's the offensive tackle number 79 for the Los Angeles Rams. So this was not, uh, Rob Havenstein, this is Rudolf Havenstein. And his namesake would be known for the destruction of money in Germany in the 1920s. That's right. If anybody even remembered. But nobody knows, nobody (laughs) cares. I was hoping that my kids were listening, and lo and behold, they missed that detail. And I think they're more inspired to listen to the details now. So Rudolf Havenstein, (laughs) lawyer, banker, introduced an aggressive monetary solution based on chartalism there in the late teens this is the 20th century in Germany, his stated opinion was that more money would help consumers pay higher prices in the post-Versailles treaty environment. So he printed more, and he printed more, and he printed more, and he printed more, (laughs) and we had hyperinflation that followed in the early 20s, sort of 1919 to 1924. Yeah, but we never learned. I mean, the United States, look at the 1960s. Well, that was a huge case because the Johnson administration, they were experimenting, again, with a blend of fiscal policy objectives and the abuse of monetary policy machinery. So that fiscal and monetary policy melange there in the 60s and 70s, you got the Great Society programs along with the war. And those commitments were being underwritten through deficit spending in the printing press. Right. And what it ended up doing is eroding our standing as a country in the international monetary system and precipitated it, led to and then precipitated the collapse of the Bretton Woods Agreement, which right. had been in place since the 1940s. And turned into real high inflation in the United States in the 70s. It created the worst domestic inflation in the United States since the Civil War. Okay, but you have new leadership in Rhodesia. So let's rename the country. Let's call it uh, Zimbabwe. Let's go ahead and create our own currency that'll be sound and stable. Mugabe. Right. Mugabe land. Robert Mugabe experimented with the chartalist mandate as well, ordering, again, you define the official currency exchange rate and then you enforce it because you have the enforcement mechanism. And what you end up with is exactly what we saw in Zimbabwe, where they're printing ultimately... The end of the story is they're printing hundred trillion dollar notes. Not quite that. That won't buy a milk carton. No, the equivalent a hundred trillion dollar note was the equivalent of forty cents. But Argentina and Venezuela in recent years have tried to pay debts and cover the cost of social programs with freshly printed paper script. All these are economic disasters today. You've got rampant inflation, which is a lingering issue. The 21st century, like the centuries that preceded it, is full of human tragedies, which are tied foundationally to the definition of money. You said human tragedies. Yes. What we're talking about here, this is why it's important. This isn't just about money and it's not just about economics. It's about starvation. It's about war. That's where these hyperinflations end. But Dave, let's face it. If you're an MMT person, you're really arguing against another flawed system. What we've had over the last 10 years has to go. It's not sustainable either. Quantitative easing and artificially low interest rates and financial repression. If I'm an MMT guy trying to sell my side of the story, I'm going to go, oh, yeah, really? 
You think artificially low interest rates are the way to go? You think quantitative easing is the way to no, go? Actually, the skids have been greased for the MMT crowd. And I think a lot of the blame for the current interest in MMT, it stems from the central banks of the world having popularized the use of zero interest rates and having already used quantitative easing. So what we would call a problem, you're basically saying grease the skids. They're not necessarily saying this system won't work. Let's just make it more efficient. Yeah, they're saying that the QE measures, which were a part of market triage uh, during and since the global financial crisis, are an example of how we shouldn't be afraid of spending lots of money. We've become comfortable, frankly, with the extremely abnormal. Mm. And, and you know, today you look at over $10 trillion of debt, and this is sovereign debt which yields less than 0%, and it's a result of these radical policies in place. But the crowd, the crowd is growing that assumes that debt is not a concern. Again, rates have never been at these levels in 5,000 years. Right. This is, this is something that is completely new. Okay. But is this not really ultimately, if it leads to inflation, a default? I think absent from the analysis is that inflation is a form of default. It's an implicit default on debt. And so while they'll argue that having all of these tools in place, you'll never default on your debt. Well, there's no reason to explicitly default on debt, but the MMT crowd has no need to explicitly default when you already have the implicit default via inflation. You know. So the political course that they're charting leads directly to that implicit debt default through currency depreciation. And again, in the modern moment, in this present moment where everyone is focusing their attention, you get all the benefit up front. Where you see the tragedy is for those who have to pick up the pieces in the next two years, five years, seven years, 25 years, etc. This goes back to the confidence game that we talked about, the movie The Sting. The ultimate person who pays is the person who thought they were going to get the game. The people will pay for this default. Well, David Ricardo, an economist, back in 1817, he said that experience shows that neither a state nor a bank ever has had the unrestricted power of issuing paper money without abusing the power. And he goes on to say that in all states, therefore, the issue of paper money ought to be under some check or control, and none seems so proper for that purpose as that of subjecting the issuers of paper money to the obligation of paying their notes, either in gold coin or bullion. I mean, two things that stand out. Number one, he's just reflecting on the history of money and saying the abuse is there. We see it over and over again. If you don't have something that ties out to a real asset, ultimately it's going to go haywire. And if you give the state the opportunity, the unrestricted power to issue paper, they will abuse the power and there will be a consequence. So don't let it happen. Spend all you want. We'll make more. Right. What political consequences are there from creating a free lunch? I mean, I think as we head into the 2020 election, even the 2024 political cycle, if you gave politicians direct access to unlimited resources using the printing press to generate the currency needed for handouts, you tell me, does that shift the balance of power? Who actually pays for the free lunch in the end? Well, you and I both talked about the analogy of taking air for granted. But actually what we're talking about is a slow suffocation. When someone dies of carbon monoxide poisoning, they never smell it. It's just there are less and less and less oxygen molecules in the atmosphere. The air doesn't smell any different and they ultimately go to sleep and die. Well, so we all do. I mean, who pays for the lunch in the end? We all do. Right. I mean, that's where it is meted out equally, but actually on a disproportional basis to those who live on a fixed income, to those who are retired and cannot do anything to increase. They're becoming monetarily suffocated. That's right. So money matters. The definition, the theories informing state and free market behaviors. And ultimately, yes, the less philosophical does matter too. How much of it do I have? What can it be exchanged for? What quantity represents a significant amount of wealth? How does a steward protect that wealth and put it to good use? History shows us, it reveals that the benefits are there, but they're front loaded. And the risks, along with the ultimate costs, are far greater than appreciated as time wears on. We go back to ancient Greece, where they say, no, if you mess with our money ever again, the death penalty for you, because you have no idea what the social and political consequences are. You have no idea. And if you've lived through it, you would never experiment with this again. 
You've been listening to the McIlvaney Weekly Commentary. I'm Kevin Oreck along with David McIlvaney. You can find us at McIlvaney.com, M-C-A-L-V-A-N-Y.com. And you can call us at 800-525-9556. This has been the McIlvaney Weekly Commentary. The views expressed should not be considered to be a solicitation or a recommendation for your investment portfolio. You should consult a professional financial advisor to assess your suitability for risk and investment. Join us again next week for a new edition of the McIlvaney Weekly Commentary.